Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Legal Tech Week, the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and innovation with our panel of legal tech journalists. It is July 12th, 2024, and we had the week off last week for the 4th of July holiday, so we've got maybe a little more to talk about than, than usual. There's actually a lot a lot to talk about, uh, and um, a lot, a lot going to be happening over the next couple of weeks, partly because of the American Association of Law Libraries convention happening with uh, some news coming out around that. And then uh, people are already gearing up for Ilticon, which is not too far down the road. And then we kind of get into full, it's like it's like 24 seven conference season now. It's like it just starts in September and goes right through, right through the year. It's kind of crazy. Uh, so uh, with that, let's get to who our panelists are today. And, and we better start quick with Nikki because she might have to dart off at any moment. So, and, and, and you have a, an announcement to share. So, Well, it's, I don't know if it's an announcement, but I do. My name is Nikki Black and I have a new title now. So I'm officially sharing my new title. It is a Principal Legal Insight Strategist. So uh, that is my new title. And uh, <laughs> A little bit less of a mouthful than the prior one, maybe not quite as cool as the legal technology evangelist one. Um, and uh, I write columns. Uh, I, so I'm a legal, principal legal insight strategist for Affinapay, which is the parent company of LawPay, my case, DocketWise, and CasePeer. And I, um, in addition to writing um, reports, uh, like uh, our benchmark and industry reports internally, I write legal tech columns for ABA Journal Above the Law and the Daily Record. Uh, I'm excited to be here and looking forward to all of the stuff we're going to talk about. <laughs> all right. Well, congratulations. Cool. Uh, Steve, you got a new title this week? <laughs> no, no new title. I'm still the president, CEO, chief financial officer, chief operations officer, and full-time janitor for Tech Law Crossroads, which is a blog about legal innovation and legal technology. <laughs> well, you keep a tidy shop, so that's a good thing as a janitor anyway. That's good. Yeah, well, unfortunately, but the chief financial officer, he's just a son of a bitch about expenses. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me do anything. Yeah. Can't even get a pro, a vision pro, you know. <laughs> I know, you know, we, we were just talking about that. Us, us, us bloggers here who don't actually work for an organization have to have to fund our own expenses here. And it's uh, sometimes limiting in terms of the, the tools and travel we can do. As, Victor, how about you? If anybody, in, if anybody in the audience would like to help Bob and I out with this, just let us know. It would be most appreciated. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're looking for someone to buy the official Legal Tech Week RV so we can travel the country uh, and take our show on the road. It's got to be a big one of those big motor coachy things. Victor, <laughs> oh, um, uh, Victor Lee, I am assistant managing, assistant managing editor for the ABA Journal. I do not have a new title, although my son has been calling me some things lately that I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, look, I I work for the ABA. Um, you know, you guys are talking, I was, I was listening to money. I'm you know, I don't know what the ethics are here, but you know, if you want to. Send me a donation to my retirement fund. I think that, you know, my private retirement fund. And, you know, I think that should be okay. Yeah. We should all just put up our uh, QR codes next week and we can uh, see how that works. Uh, and Joe. Joe Patrice from Above the Law and Thinking Like a Lawyer podcast. podcast. And I uh, do not have any fun new titles, uh, but I would, I, would, I would love the uh, RV situation. I actually might parents got an RV a few years ago because they weren't in a position to go flying places anymore. And uh, they're, some of them these days are really nice. I don't know if you've been in one of them lately, but they're, they're wild. Some of the stuff that some of the amenities they have. now. I've, 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 I've ventured into a couple of RV shows now and then uh, and, and check some of these things out. Yeah. It's either that or the big boat. I can't decide which one I want to buy. Uh, all right, and I am uh, Bob Ambrogi. I am the principal legal insight author at Law Sites blog, uh, and also the uh, principal legal insight uh, interviewer at uh, Law Next podcast, and the uh, proprietor uh, or co-proprietor of the Law Next Legal Tech Directory. And uh, so, uh, to, to get it kicked off today, we uh, 
we've been talking, uh, you know, quite a bit over the last year or two years about uh, many of the potential positive impacts of artificial intelligence in law. Uh, but I, I feel like we've got a couple of stories this week that that kind of point to maybe some of the limitations uh, of that technology. And uh, Joe, I, I really, I really like your your story. I thought maybe we could kick kick it off with yours on on the question of kind of is this as good as it gets? Yeah. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, those of you who watch uh, this show regular, or listen to or watch either way this show regularly, know that a few weeks ago, I, I kind of there was that report that came out about the level of electricity use that AI is starting to suck up. And I raised the possibility that, you know, maybe we're going to start reaching a point where this is just not worth it, uh, the investment. Uh, and, you know, and it was brought up in the comments that there's also heavy demands on water usage because, you know, they got to cool all that stuff. With that said, uh, so I said that and thought about it and just was like, look, I see a lot of promise to AI, but, you know, there's these issues. This week, uh, Ed Zitron has been very anti-AI all along. Uh, so he's taking a bit of a victory lap in his newsletter. He pointed out that Goldman Sachs, of all institutions, is pretty down on AI all of a sudden with a new report that they just released. Uh, obviously, Goldman Sachs is a, you know, bleeding heart environmentalist concern. So maybe that's part of it. No, obviously, what we're talking about is the most bloodthirsty you know, kick your mother down the stairs for an extra penny entity in the world has determined that they don't see enough return on the investment for AI. Uh, their reasoning included the electricity issues, but they also talked a lot about training uh, and that for where AI is, which they don't feel is sufficient to generate enough revenue for the outlay that has already happened, they note that to get much better, AI, even AI gurus, the folks from Anthropic and OpenAI say to get better, it's going to take, you know, 10, 10 to even $100 billion uh, to spend on new training to get those returns. They speak with a MIT expert on it who says that, you know, even, or no, actually it wasn't him, but uh, there was a paper recently that suggested that to receive linear returns to improving AI models will require exponential outputs of more money. Given that, Goldman says, look, if that's what it takes, we don't deny that there's something that a generative AI can do, but the amount of money that even a perfect generative AI can deliver is not enough to justify that cost, uh, which bringing us to where my article about this came in, which is, you know, that's bad news for people who see a world where AI is doing everything. But maybe for legal, this is as good as it gets. And that's OK. Maybe, you know, like where we are, you know, where it can summarize documents pretty well, could get a little bit better, but not, it doesn't need to get too much better to do that job. Where it can look at, into legal research and summarize stuff pretty well, where it can help you refine your legal searches a little bit by providing some suggestions. Maybe that's all we realistically should want out of an AI solution in law. And frankly, uh, that that does save us a lot of time and a lot of billable hours if necessary. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really interesting observation uh, just because, you know, it's in a lot of ways, when you think about where we were a year and a half ago talking about the advent of generative AI and how quickly things were going to change. And then where we are now, you know, it, what uh, was it March, March of 2023, I think that co-counsel came out, right? That uh, K6 co-counsel came out and uh, I mean, a lot happened and they got acquired. And, but when you look at the products that are coming out now, um, or even how co-counsel has evolved other than its acquisition, we're still talking about the same stuff. We're talking about summarization and kind of, uh, you know, being able to kind of do some kind of quick interrogation of, of document sets and uh, 
some document generation capabilities that in, in sometimes are, are useful, sometimes aren't much better than good old fashioned document automation systems that existed for a number of years. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways, it, it seems like we have, it almost feels like we are a little bit on, a, on at least a plateau in terms of what's going on with AI in, in legal. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I are, you, are you suggesting, Joe, that it may ultimately be cheaper to pay lawyers by the hour as opposed to <laughs> paying for <laughs> AI <laughs> to, to, to do the work? I, I, you know, maybe yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it would mean quite quite the segue there. Uh, but yeah, I just, I think there, I don't know as though that's necessarily at that point for everything, but there are tasks where that is going to get to be the point. Uh, one point, one aspect of this report that uh, I hadn't touched on yet was that there are, you know, there there's kind of the sci-fi level of hey, you know, AGI comes and then we have like real human-like intelligence out there, and to the extent that's even a doable thing, where what Gen AI can hope to ever accomplish is not those sorts of tasks. It's it's never going to be able to solve some of the core money-saving tasks, as Goldman argues, that people talk about. What it can do is stuff like summarizations, which is super valuable as a legal aspect, but just isn't, isn't it's not something that can be readily adapted to something else. I, I guess the analogy would be like saying, you know, cars are cool and you know we would love to fly places it's like the, the the car doesn't really get you there you can envision how the development of a motor might be involved in that later technology but it's not that technology and building faster and faster cars does not ever get you into the air without something completely different and where where they see it is a lot of the sci-fi level promises of ai just aren't things that building better and better gen AI is capable of elevating you to. Well, I mean, Steve, Steve, since you, I don't know if anybody else wanted to comment that, but Steve, since you queued it up a little bit, I mean, that, that was actually <laughs> what I was thinking is that you're obviously your story is somewhat related to Joe's story because yeah. uh, it, 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 what was it your story? Richard Troman's an artificial lawyer Richard wrote Trumans. the story, but yeah. uh, you, you picked it up, but um, you know, it, it, it raises some, some questions about maybe one of the possible reasons that, AI isn't <laughs> getting more quickly. Well, it, yeah, it, you know, it's interesting on a lot of levels. What, what Richard did is he took a look at the uh, Thomson Reuters study, Future of Professions Report, and there was a piece in there where they said that <clears throat> the uh, generative AI tools could save lawyers four hours a week in the next year and up to 12 hours a week over the next five years, and somehow that could translate to roughly $100,000 and extra billable time that lawyers would have and of course the problem is <laughs> it's right you're you're taking away billable time which means you know now lawyers will have to find a way to replace if this is in fact true replace uh a hundred thousand dollars worth of billable time you know in an atmosphere where generative ai is taking away at least some of the low-hanging fruit that many lawyers do they may not they may be overqualified to do it but they do it and and that's again grows out of the fact that most law firms that bill by the hour particularly larger firms have billable hour quotas and if you don't hit your quota then you know bad things will happen uh it doesn't matter whether you're a partner or an associate you combine that with the fact that Historically, over what the last 30, maybe 50 years, the entire legal profitability of the legal community for billable hours lawyers have been based upon leverage models, which fuel this enormous growth in, uh, in lawyer count. And there's an incredible number of lawyers, many of whom are saddled with huge student debt, but it was all sort of based on this notion that Bill more hours, make more money, leverage cases as much as they as, as they can be, and we'll have this fantastic pyramid, which has worked very well. But if what Thompson Reuters is saying is indeed turns out to be correct, then 
that model it begins to turn itself on its on the head on its head because if that's correct, then as as Richard talks about, law firms need to start looking at alternative fee models where the reverse is true. The less you do, the more you make, kind of thing. Um, but even if that were to happen, I mean, you, you sift through all of that, you get to the bottom line. That means there's going to be less work that there's less work for lawyers to do that they have historically perhaps done. So we're going to have an oversatur could have an oversaturated market for lawyers looking for work to do that's not there uh, any longer. And that's going to be completely a remarkable change in the profession, I think, for, for many lawyers. Um, you know, the, the, the response to that always is, so, oh, well, the lawyers will find other things to do. There'll still be work for lawyers to be done. You know, we'll be like the banks and ATM and you know, all the people that work for banks that were going to be replaced by ATMs. They still work. There's more people working for banks. Blah, blah, yeah, blah. I, I think we have to all be very careful in making assumptions like that because one, we have a tool that we've never really had before. And two, even if you say there are more people working for banks after the ATMs than before, they're just doing other things. Well, they're not bank tellers anymore. They're, they're bank something else's. You turn that to the legal profession, you say, well, they won't be lawyers anymore. They'll be doing something else. Um, I'm not sure what that something else is, is, and I'm not sure whether many of the lawyers out there are qualified are trained to do the something else. So I think we, you know, it, Richard's article sort of sort of made me think about there are there could be some significant disruption in the marketplace, no matter whether this drives a stake in the heart or the billable hour, or it doesn't. Um, either way, I think there's still some significant could be some significant disruption. Now, if, if Joe's correct in his in his thesis, and it, you may very well be, then we'll have sort of this limited disruption, and things will keep on going, and everybody will keep going by the hour, and everybody will try to keep going fat and happy. Um, so, you know, it was an interesting take on what what at first blush appeared to be stating the obvious, but on second blush, you think, well, you know, there, there's a reason that, that lawyers are not jumping to these efficiencies as fast as perhaps they should. And it's all driven by this this all-encompassing global hour model, which not only affects profitability, all the law firms are built on that model, from the culture to advancement to everything else. So, so anyway, I thought it was a pretty interesting, interesting approach, as, as his stuff usually is. One thing that I thought was interesting about it was the idea that it'll – make room for even more billable work and you know it's it's this and if i feel like we're at this this sort of interesting point in history and in terms of technology where the promise of technology is it's supposed to make our lives easier it's supposed to give us more leisure time it's supposed to give us more time if you will but instead um what's it's it's you know it's like the utopia or the dystopia it's going in this like dystopian direction of you can work even harder. You can get even more done. You can make even more money, um, but not you, the people above you. You can make more money for your employer and get all this work done. Um, and, and it's also interesting because until we replace your job with these tools and they get sophisticated enough, in which case you're going to be out on the street, but don't plan to sleep there because now we're making that illegal. So you can't sleep on the street. You're just going to be on the street. Um, and we're not going to support you with any government programs or come up with like a livable wage or whatever the case may be. You know, it's just you have to hang in here and support the, you know, your employer until we get to the point where we don't need you anymore. And then you're just kind of on your own and pull yourself up by your bootstraps or retire, which is what all the older lawyers have been telling me over and over. Well, it's about time for me to retire with all this AI stuff. I'm out. Like I'm out a year earlier than I thought I was or I'm done. So I think we're at this really interesting point where we're just heading towards this <clears throat> weird dystopian world. And I think that it was became evident we were headed in that direction and this leads into what I'm going to talk about, but I, I don't think you need to segue now. But, you know, we everyone thought that when we the apocalypse hit or the pandemic hit, 
the world would stop and we can all just relax. But no, we just had to work right through it, you know. So it's right. like we're just going <laughs> in the weird direction. <laughs> well, then, you know, it, it is interesting, Nikki, because, you know, in, in my experience, the, the, the lawyers that are really good at what they do, I mean, if you if you ask them, do you have enough time to to do everything you want to do for your clients? Most of them will say no, because I've got all these other little tasks out there. For people like that, it could be a real all these tools could be a real plus because they would have the time. But, you know, it's, it's like when people will say, well, you know, lawyers will have the time to do what they do best. And that's visioning and strategizing. And I thought, well, that's great. But in my experience over the years, we don't, there are not that many people that are really good at visioning and strategizing, you know? <laughs> I mean, what what's the viral tweet that somebody wrote uh, early on in this whole thing? Uh, when I envisioned AI, I wanted something to do my laundry, do the dishes and all the laundry, and so I could write and paint. Not something that could write and paint, so I have to do more dishes and laundry. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I wanted to kind of interject with a side story I saw after I submitted my story already, but it hinges on kind of on what Nikki mentioned about the homelessness part uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about AI as something in addition to all this, whether it makes money, uh, which for the law firms, whatever, uh, my story kind of talks about the more, does it make money at the level of building the engine that then goes into these law firm products. But we there's also the value outside of whether it makes money for law firms of, you know, and this is a question we got in the chatting. Uh, it, it, maybe it helps people, and that's a good thing, too. Uh, and on that front, we have talked about the level to which it can be valuable as a, a access to justice issue because people have been priced out of lawyers. It should not replace lawyers, but sometimes knowing that you need, knowing what you don't know is a thing in, in and of itself. And the fact that ChatGPT could see your problem and go, you know what, you should hire a human lawyer uh, has a value uh, in and of itself. That said... Uh, while I have agreed with championing that, I saw today that the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court was testifying in front of the legislature about how great Gen AI is and how it's something that they really all need to be investing in because it could really deal with access to justice. And I thought this guy uh, was this court. Less than a month ago, struck down uh, in Texas as unconstitutional, a the, the Houston giving aid to poor people. Uh, so the idea that he's like wrapping himself in the we have to help fix access to justice when he just struck down the idea that you could give 500 bucks to a family who's struggling with being able to stay in their apartment is so rich and also goes to what I, and the reason I thought about it was because of Nikki's point, like this is the problem with where late stage capitalism is. There's a risk of this AI product, which could be valuable, turning into this empty signifier of we just dump into it all of our hopes and dreams while they continue to get dashed everywhere else. Uh, oh, it's going to fix this thing that we refuse to fix elsewhere. Uh, much like space travel became the, oh, we could clean water, but also we could build rockets and leave the planet, you know? Anyway. I wonder if people really, I mean, we talk about access to justice all the time on the show, and it's second nature for us. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if people really under, like, if, sorry, my, uh, my, that's the access to justice bark, and that brings oh. us to our, no, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> uh, sorry. There, Someone's mowing a lawn outside and my dog really doesn't like that. <laughs> um, she, she's doing the get off my lawn speech as we, as we, uh, as we, as we speak. Um, <laughs> so I'll make a quick, yeah. I wonder if people really understand what that means though. Like, I mean, and not the people who watch the show or not the people in, in, in legal circles, but like the regular people really understand what access to justice really entails. Like if, they, if that's really a concern of theirs or if they're more concerned about just, you know, yeah, you know, like, like bread and butter stuff. Like, am I going to have, am I going to have money for rent? Am I going to have money for this? You know, um, yeah, I don't really know if they're really thinking about like, you know, oh, what are my remedies? What are what are things I can do in order to, you know, um, maybe maybe you know, delay delay some of these things or 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 help myself out in a situation or things like that. So I I don't, I don't know if people are really thinking to that extent. Um, they don't they don't think about it until they have a legal problem and then and then they become aware of it. That's that's when it happens. 
Yeah. And, I, and as, I, often, as I said, and sometimes they don't know they have a legal problem, and that's the place where I see right. a real value. Right. But they don't see it as a systemic problem. They see it as their a problem they're having. It's a personal. And, yeah. yeah. And, and it usually comes problem. down to, it usually comes down to that they recognize that, that they've been harmed in some fashion. But hiring a lawyer is, is just not, it's just out of the question. They, their belief is too expensive. And if they ask around and make some inquiries, they typically find out because they can't afford it. So the problem just goes unresolved. They get screwed. Yeah. And it's the same idea. Um, people hate lawyers. They think lawyers are sleazy. They think they're unethical until suddenly they're arrested. Now they want the best lawyer who's going to be like what they consider to be sleazy and unethical on their behalf. You know, like people just um, operate, from, I think, from very selfish perspectives when it comes to our profession in particular, as the way they view it and the way that they and when they need it, you know, need the yeah. services of a lawyer. But I think there is there certainly are plenty of examples out there. And if you go to like the legal services conference, you'll see plenty of examples where developers are currently using generative AI technology to truly enhance access to justice. I mean, there's small steps. It's not going to change the world overnight, but they are, you know, using it to build better, you know, information portals, better document generation tools, uh, that sort of thing that will at least chip away. I mean, it, it, none of it goes back to the to the big systemic problem and and uh, to the whole billable hour problem and everything else. I mean, obviously, the whole way legal services are are priced in the world is a, a major cause of the access to justice crisis. Crisis, but uh, um, you know, it, it certainly holds promise for that. And and I think you know, I, I even though I, I made the comment earlier about gen, generative AI. The, the sort of this appearance that is sort of plateaued. I don't really believe that it's plateaued. I, I, I think I do still believe we're in the, the pretty early innings on this stuff and that we're going to see some pretty amazing tools getting developed over the next couple of years. Um, but uh, I thought that the, the I'm going to just move over to this, the story I did this week before we move on to Victor and Victor and Nikki, just because I, I thought it was kind of related only because it was, I was, I, I just wrote this morning about, uh, both VLEX and, and Paxton AI having kind of this week rolled out um, Citator services like, you know, like Keysight or Shepherds, uh, that sort of thing, um, which which has been kind of the holy grail for, for legal tech startups for as long as anybody can remember. I would I kind of mentioned in my article going back to the early days of Case Text when they tried to create a crowdsourced Citator where, you know, they, they would have people come and read cases, uh, just their users come and read cases and, and uh, try and tag them as, as, as good law or not and comment on them and other people kind of do thumbs up and thumbs down. This has been an age old problem. It's one that Fastcase worked on for a long time uh, or tried to work on for a long time. And they had their bad law bot thing that they, they developed a number of years ago, which would basically go and, and look, look, in cases for kind of signal words like, you know, overturned or uh, th that sort of thing, uh, reversed, whatever, uh, and, and could tag cases that way. Um, but so this week, uh, it was, first it was Paxton AI that came out with a generative AI uh, citator service, which they claim has a, a very high rate of accuracy and they, they tested it against a data set that uh, that uh, demonstrated that they they say I, I haven't used it at all and I don't, I don't know how accurate it is, uh, but I, I thought it was interesting then contracting contrasting that with with Fastcase because I and Vlex because uh, when when I saw that I kind of remembered that that Vlex has been talking about releasing a citator and I called Ed Walters at, at Fastcase and you know he said yeah you know we we as it turns out we've we've just released ours in in May and we're rolling it out to all the states through our upgraded. Uh, Fastcase VLEX platform, their new platform. Uh, but I thought what's interesting is is that, you know, it, and again, more background, they, they in 2020 acquired Judicata, the California legal tech, legal research startup in, in large part because Judicata had built a pretty sophisticated uh, kind of programmatic citator, AI driven citator. Um, but, but Ed said that just in, in trying to expand that to all 50 states and federal cases, they just found that it was really ultimately impossible to build a, a 
reliable, uh, consistently accurate citator based using only AI that in fact they needed to build up a team of human editors like guess who's done for years like like Thomson Reuters has done like LexisNexis has done uh, and so I mean they actually you know did that I mean they they've got a, a team down in Charlottesville Virginia uh, and I mean they found that you know for AI could could accurately uh, uh, define the sort of the subsequent treatment or the or the whether a case is good law or not about about 60 for about 60 percent of cases but there but but 40 percent is is a big number of cases and and and, and you know that doesn't that only gets you so far so they've you know resorted back to the need for you know editors in the loop if you want to call it that uh as part of their generative ai build citator so uh i'm not saying that that paxton's doesn't work or that other attempts to do that doesn't work because i haven't tried it and i haven't tested it they, they do put out some data on theirs that that's interesting to see uh, uh but uh it does, you know, it's it's another example of how you, you you know you start to see perhaps potentially limitations of, of generative AI uh, or the or the fact that generative AI can only take you so far, uh, but doesn't get you all the way to the finish line in terms of developing products. Yeah, I thought I thought that the, the difference was interesting, but I suppose it's like a lot of that stuff is how you how you quantify what you're measuring it. I mean, if you're using a tool only to look for cases where the word overruled specifically is set out in the in the text, then that's easier for a machine to figure out. If you're looking for cases that you have to understand sort of the context to see if it's really overruled or not, that's different. And the other thing is, I wonder, you know, you say 60% accuracy rate, that's fun, but what's the human accuracy rate? <laughs> I mean, I can remember when we using shepherds and it would say overruled, you'd go read the case and say, well, that really doesn't seem to be overruled. You know, so, so you have to be care careful with the accuracy rates, I think. Well, and you have to do that anyway with, I, I guess now the Supreme Court is more apt to do things, but for a long time, the Roberts led court was overruling shit left and right and being like, this isn't an overrule, like explicitly saying, we are not overruling, but. Uh, and, you know, obviously the Supreme Court's not what most everyday people's work deals with, but they, but he sparked a lot of lower uh, appellate level federal, federal society, federal judges who did the same thing, who would write opinions that'd be like, in no way are we overruling Roe when we say that obviously we can limit it to one week. Uh, so like that was the way things worked for a long time. And that is the sort of thing that whether that's good, bad, or indifferent for law, the answer is bad. Uh, it is really bad for AI. Uh, there was a whole decade basically in there where there's decisions happening that say, oh, we aren't overruling things. And anybody who knows enough can read it and be like the hell you are i i have to appreciate the sarah glassmeyer thinking out of the box questions our entire common law system here i mean we're, we're worried about simple problems of ai and uh maybe, maybe we've just got the wrong legal system altogether and can we can we get generative ai to just kind of start from scratch and do it have a whole do-over I think we should uh, call on anybody who is potentially trained in how the Napoleonic Code works. How about that? Exactly. Yeah. So I said, move to move to Louisiana. Yeah, we could work there. Louisiana, yeah. I was like, Vicky, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us. Uh, well, I didn't say I knew. Right. I, I I mean, I spent time in Louisiana. I, I don't. I didn't say I understood that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and on the question of what packs it is packing, patenting, I did mention in my article, I asked them for a copy of the patent application. They didn't give it to me. Uh, so I'll be interested to see that. Uh, it's not public yet uh, on the U.S. I mean, at some point in its processing, it'll it'll obviously become available on the USPTO site. Uh, but uh, they were not uh, willing to share it at this point. So I'm not sure what they're patenting there. Uh, all right, so we have 
two of you more or less selecting the same story this week, which is great because it's a great story and lots to talk about there, I think. But Nikki, you were first. <laughs> you want to kick it off? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's a story that um, Victor co-wrote with a few other people at the ABA Journal. Um, about uh, what lawyers learned from the pandemic. And I thought it was really interesting. And, and it basically consists of just quotes from people across the spectrum, from lawyers to people in legal tech. And I, I'm aware of it, partly because I was quoted in it. And so that definitely brought us my attention. But what was interesting was- um, But they got your title wrong. Well, it's a new, it, it was official as of today, so. Yeah, well, we, this went to press like like uh, a couple months ago. So, you know, Nikki may have had four titles by then. You know. yeah. Okay. Um, that was three titles ago, yeah. I've been with my case 12 years. Come on, my title can switch a little. Get, cut me some slack. Um, but, uh, so it, but it was really interesting because it was, I think that there's a, a number of things that are interesting about the pandemic. Uh, a, and now that we're sort of as much as we can be on the other side of it, we all kind of want to forget about it and what happened. And it's like this black hole in terms of the passage of time. Um, all the changes that happened were so blunt and brutal almost, like you didn't have a choice. They happened so quickly that they seem like, you know, that, that, you know, that was years ago. But it's really interesting from this vantage point, you know, four years later to look back and see uh, you know, speaking to different lawyers, how much things have changed. And, you know, there have been some significant changes and you see these patterns throughout the responses, but, you know, in-person meetings and Zoom, you know, versus Zoom meetings and the willingness to meet um, online and to get certain things accomplished online that just before the pandemic, it was conference calls and that was it. And everyone hated conference calls. They were horrible, but, you know, there are entire memes and skits about how awful they were, but, you know, so I mean that has completely changed the understanding that work. Oh, wait, and are there not are there not memes and skits about how awful Zoom conversations? Of course, there are, but it's better. You got to admit it's better than conference calls, especially for like remote depositions, and you know because you can see the person, you can see how they're reacting. Um, this may very well be when I just as I'm speaking, but I'll be down in a minute. Um, uh, and it was just so interesting to see that. It was interesting to see the changes in perspectives of remote work and that remote work, work can be done. And um, and also just that there are so many different, um, and, and also just this acceptance that certain things are kind of permanently changed and, and the, the uh, adapting to technology. And like the cloud now is just a given. Everyone had to go into the cloud. There was still so much resistance. And at this point, everyone for the most part is in the cloud and it's safer and everyone acknowledges that which is so interesting to me because for years and years and years like my cloud book almost didn't get published because i think there was a significant amount of resistance in 2012. it went through so many rounds of peer review and and uh a lot of people thought it was i think um it was that it was unwise and that i was making um recommendations that were not supported by fact or something. I don't know what it was, but on, you know, on the other side of the pandemic, it's pretty clear that that is where we've ended up. So I thought that was really interesting and um, it's a great read and it's just great to see how uh, different lawyers experienced it and, and the different perspectives, because not everyone was coming from the same, um, there was some different sort of alternate one person. So they travel more because people aren't traveling and allows them to buttress their relationships better since most people aren't meeting in person. So it was interesting and it's a really good read. You, know, you did a good job, Victor. Thank you. Yeah, Victor, yeah, no, Victor this, your take? This, well, yeah, I mean, um, I, I thought I thought I did a good job too on it. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no yeah, so like, uh, I mean, we we have certain you know franchises, uh, you know, set at, at at the journal, and this is one of them where we do like tips, um, uh, in our June July issue. Um, actually, I, I think I think before it was April May. I think we moved it this year. Um, but you know, typically around around the middle of the year, we'll do like these tips thing. We we've done several of these now, like over the last few years. Like there was uh, one about um, advice that you would give to people who want to start their own practice. Uh, there was one about like uh, um, you know wellness tips for for lawyers and things like that. So you know, when I, when I was coming up with this idea, I, I just kind of I mean, because we I, actually part of the part of the idea stemmed from these conversations, kind of like how has the pandemic changed uh, the the legal industry? What what is what is what what kind of things are here to stay? What kind of things maybe aren't here to stay? What things were sort of like done out of necessity at the time, and what kind of things you know have 
actually stuck around. So I was kind of curious as a sort of like, okay, well, what are what are lawyers who are actually practicing or people who are in the field or people who are doing this kind of work? What are what how's their how has their um you know professional how 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 have their professional lives changed um as a result of the pandemic? And what were some good things that came out of it that they still um you know that they, they've integrated into their practice today? And so yeah, I mean um, we farmed it out to the to the to the different writers. So like I think the first one I did was um it, it, it was just me. And so like, you know, the, the people that, that I reach out to are people that you would expect <laughs> people that I, I I speak to at conferences, people that I, that are probably well known to a lot of the people uh, on this call. Um, so, but you know, the, so the good thing about giving out to the other re reporters is that, you know, they, they reach out to their, their sources, people that they know, people who aren't necessarily, you know, of the, of the, of the, of the tech mindset, so to speak. So, you know, there were some tech, some tech ones and some wellness ones and some, um, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the ones I thought was very interesting was sort of this idea of, you know, I mean, people always talk about having like an emergency emergency plan in place, but, you know, do law firms really have them? Do law firms really, you know, have something that, you know, will ensure continuity of business in case something happens? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic or if it's a natural disaster or if it's, uh, you know, God forbid, something something even worse. Um, and I think, you know, that's maybe maybe the biggest lesson that people need to take from that is that, well, you know, you never know what's coming around the corner. You know, it, 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 it's these are crazy times. Um, you know, we talk about COVID as if it's, as if it's in the past tense. Meanwhile, I think, you know, we're currently in a surge. I think a bunch of people I know just got it again. So who knows? I mean, I don't think we're going to go back to being shut down, but what if the next thing comes, comes out, it's even worse. And, you know, or, or if something else happens, you, you know, you want to make sure you have that some kind of plan in place so that, you know, you can easily pivot to, um, you know, uh, if you, if you weren't already, you know, had, to, had a plan for that, you know, you want to be able to do that. So, you know, hopefully People can can learn something from the uh, from these tips. Maybe 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 these are things that you were already doing, and this is just you know confirmation of that. Or maybe these are some ideas that you know can help people. You know, um, um, you know, either even if something doesn't happen, just just improve their practice and maybe you know uh, enjoy enjoy themselves a little bit more. So, hope hope you guys check it out. Yeah, it was a good read. Um, one of the ones I. If I if anybody had asked me to add to it, I would have might have put in it, it thanks to the pandemic, we got rid of ties for men. I don't think I've seen anybody wear a tie now in like five years, but well uh, you are I'm not sure I can remember how to tie one to tell you the truth. <laughs> well well it's funny. I, 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 actually dress up, I had to dress up for something when I was um like I like I do I do I do like a presentation or something. I, like um so I did have to like put on a tie and a jacket. But I was like, I'm sitting down. I'm not going to stand up. I can just wear sweatpants. It's not a big deal. Oh yeah. <laughs> luckily, totally. I didn't have no, to stand I keep, up. I actually have a tie hanging here because I have to get on. I sometimes I have to put my lawyer hat on. But uh, yeah, right. remembering how to tie it is a challenge. So, so I remember how to tie it because I I recently been on CNN uh, as we discussed, <laughs> but uh, haven't been since the haven't been since the Trump trial ended, which by the way, why was I like a good New York civil in criminal, New York criminal practice person? I'm, I'm like, I only ever practiced in federal court. I have no idea about the intricacies of that, but whatever. I was should've on. Nikki. Uh, well, exactly. Nikki should have been on that. And I should, and then during, once the Supreme Court stuff started coming down, I wasn't anywhere. And I was like, that's the thing I actually under, whatever. Uh, but, you know, when you say it got rid of the tie for men, like, are you all, you're just all irritating poor Derek, uh, Derek guy or whatever, the workwear guy on Twitter, everybody following him. You should, no if idea. you don't, he's, <laughs> oh, he's, he's like the, the, the big, uh, he's huge on Twitter now. Cause he, he's ventured into politics weirdly, but he does these long, screeds about men's wear and how it how men's fashion should work okay people in comments are agreeing uh how men's fashion should work and he's so right about all of it like you don't have to wear a tie with everything but if so your jacket should not be this kind of jacket it's it, it's very instructive uh but he also uses it to make fun of various people uh politically too so it's a great 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 uh follow uh, work die workwear, I think is what it's called. Anyway, yeah, but it is true that even in uh, even in formal conferences now on Zoom, uh, pe participants who in the old days would have been dressed up 
for that conference yeah. will now have a sports shirt on or, you know, or uh, whatever, whatever the female equivalent of a sports shirt is. I don't know. But, uh, you know, th I mean, these are like officiating people like, you know, on, on a call, I do a lot of calls with legislators and they're sometimes, you know, sitting in their t-shirts or something. It, it, it's, it's a whole new world from, uh, from what it was before. So that, that's a big plus. I feel like for <laughs> yeah. women, it's become more of like a, barely ever wear bras, no more shaving. Like we were all like living in our houses, like cave people. And then we came out, we're like, what do you mean we're supposed to start binding ourselves up and doing all this work? Forget about it. So I think that like for women, it was like a different direction, but. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the same direction, right? Like, like the, the men, the men basically were like, Oh yeah, no, we're, we took them off during the pandemic. We're going to leave them off. The, the problem is you can do that, but not with the accessories you choose to think like you can't you can't bolt on old fashioned things to this new thing and make it make sense you've got to like embrace a more holistic change uh if you're going to do it which is the thing to nikki's point that women have done a much better job of is making a holistic change to this is now the real world whereas men are like let me just wear my suit without a tie. And it's like, that looks terrible. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good read and it, it's interesting because it, 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 it focuses on some of the specifics. I mean, we all, we all talk a lot about the big picture changes that have happened because of this, but this gets a little more down into the weeds in terms of uh, some of the things they talk about, uh, like, like marriages breaking up and, uh, and that sort of thing. Everyone uh, realized yeah. they didn't stand each other when they were stuck in a house together. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think it's been quite remarkable what it's done to to part of the litigation world. You know, <clears throat> I talk to a lot of lawyers, even as, in a state like Kentucky that's fairly rural, and and most judges are conducting hearings via Zoom, and uh, many depositions are taken via Zoom, and it's uh, that doesn't seem to be changing and it, it's it is a fundamental change because there used to be you would you would have to go to motion hour and sit there for three hours so your motion came up which was a terrible waste of time except that you learned what other lawyers were doing and what they were working on and often i mean i settled cases at motion hours just because we had to be in the same room for a fair amount of time what else are we going to talk about but the case we have together and so that that is kind of disappearing i think which in a way is, is sad. I mean, it's, it's terribly inefficient, but. It's also really impacting um, local bar associations. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, all the bar associations, and that's an interesting thing we don't talk about a lot on this show, but the bar association and the, their value prop, like both from a national, state, and local level has changed over the years. You know, the they were just as significantly impacted by the digital revolution as like, you know, newspapers were um, because CLEs were always a primary driver for revenue. And and that completely changed once you had like Lawline and all these online CLEs that were much cheaper or even, and now that the tech companies are offering free CLE accreditation, you know? And so it's interesting to see how it's also sort of um, how the pandemic is impacting bar associations because they're already having a lot of issues pre-pandemic. And now that used to be the place where a lot of, for most of the lawyers, a lot of the networking would happen other than in the halls of justice, right? And they're, that in-person networking is just falling by the wayside because people, yeah. and you know, meetings are happening online instead of everyone having to go downtown or wherever it is. And and so, uh, and I think bar associations provide really valuable, uh, they're, they're incredibly valuable <clears throat> but they're all struggling to figure out what are the, what are our new value props that are going to make people pay money to join us. And the large firms are now providing their own CLEs in house, and so they don't they don't just have everyone join the bar automatically. And so it's interesting to see right. how the digital world and then the pandemic and the changes wrought by the pandemic are also impacting this what used to be sort of the backbone of the practice of law. Well, and, and the, it used to be that it used to be that the, you know all the all the conferences the people. You had to offer CLE to get people to go because that's, you know, yeah. I mean, I would justify well, now you can get CLE in place so that you have to kind of, as you said, Nikki, rethink the value proposition of what your conference is going to offer. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sorry, I was going to say, on. oh, I no, no problem. I was going to say 
and that's in states like the ones where a lot of us practice, where bar association membership is voluntary. These states, these smaller states for years have gotten by with, hey, at least everybody has to join. And the Supreme Court has been at war with the concept of you having mandatory bar association membership because, God forbid, the First Amendment uh, exists for anything except forcing people to not speak, weirdly as that sounds. And they've been crushing these bar association, mandatory bar association memberships, which is going to kill a few more. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Anything anybody else uh, wanted to raise uh, that we haven't talked about or didn't put on our story spreadsheet in advance? I don't, other than to say that my P doom is now zero based on my story, and I think it may be lower for others too. Oh God, I forgot about our P doom. Okay, all right. I know I forgot about it What's... too, but then I'm kind of like, eh, let's, yeah. Well, so what is your what number is that? What what's your low number you're going to give to it to? I'm giving it zero. I, I am not zero. scared of AI. Yeah, we're good. All right. Uh, Nikki, how about what's your what's your P doom score this week? Well, <clears throat> in the summers we move out um, and live what I would call more rustically, but most people would say it's probably not rustic at all. But because we have to, we the we can't drink the water and we have to ship water in. My stove's run by a propane tank, propane tank, and we have a septic tank that's getting pumped sometime today i don't know i'm i feel like i'm living how off are you the surviving grid. under those conditions i don't know i feel like i'm living <laughs> off the grid although i'm in a perfectly lovely place but so i'm i'm feeling kind of uns i don't like how everything feels unstable <clears throat> even though i'm in a beautiful place so i'm gonna put my p doom really high because uh, uh, because of my own personal struggles with you know <laughs> gonna, All right. i'm gonna put it up to uh um I'm going to call it 65, which is actually lower than all the other weeks. So. All right. Completely unrelated. Victor, Victor what's your, what's your P doom looking like today? So we're just talking in general uh, and not just necessarily related to, to tech. My P doom was actually quite high because the other day, um, you know, my son came up to me and was just like, you don't know what you're doing. And I'm like, you know, that could apply to all sorts of things. kid. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm doing on a lot of things. So I'm going to go with, 70. Whoa. Whoa. I... All right, Steve. Well, I've been reminded in the chat, for those of you that are concerned about the PDIM score, there is an opportunity to do something about it. You can submit a proposal to speak at Tech Show, which will be April 2nd through the 5th in lovely Chicago. And uh, proposals are due at the close of business on Monday. So if you have something you want to propose, please get it in. I'm, I'm a little like Victor. I'm kind of a little high, too. So I, maybe not 70, but maybe 50 or so. Certainly not zero. Wait, you all think we're going to die? Oh, all right. Well, also, also, I mean, he mentioned tech show. The fact that it's moving to McCormick Place is also added to my P doom a little bit. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever been there, like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I was I'm not, just there. Yeah, I'm not looking. It's a for lot it. of walking. We had a presentation in a room that I counted, seated around 1,600 people, and like 150 people showed up, and it felt like it was empty because everyone spread themselves out across 1,600 people. Envision how big this room is, and so I, I, I hope I think that's going to be a little bit of a challenge at Tech Show because I don't know what rooms they've got, but if they're they're getting provided those rooms, it's it's a really strange feeling to present to a room. It is, I like that. We it is on the radar. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you know, it'll be a different experience, that's for sure, because we won't be downtown. But on the other hand, you know, we should have some a much more openness. There'll be more room for lots of things that are that are going on. And so, you know, it 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 was one of those things we didn't have much of a choice. So we yeah. have to have to make the best of it. <laughs> it's a nice location. It, and the walking, there is a trick to walking to get where you need to go. And you don't, you can't follow the signs because it takes you three times as long. So there's a trick. 
that we'll have to make sure that everyone's aware of, like a shortcut. <laughs> Closer yeah, golf time. carts, golf carts like Adulta. <laughs> it's actually pretty short if you go the right way. Oh, all right. All right. Well, I've got, I, if, if we're evaluating PDOOM scores based on uh, the housing that we're in at any given moment, I might have to have a very high one having had a couple of estimates done on work I need at my house this week. But if we're, if we're doing it based on uh, a fear of uh, fear, of, fear or lack of fear on technology. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I might, I'm down this week. I was feeling pretty bad last week. I think or last time we asked a couple of weeks ago, but I, I'm going to go down to like a 40 this week or something. I'm kind of with Joe, not not as low as Joe, but I'm I'm uh, a little more optimistic about the future of this week. Uh, and uh, so so I'm going with that. And uh, interesting note in the chat that I did not know the creator of Word Perfect passed away. So there are there are 10 or so older lawyers out there who are going to be very sad to hear that news. Uh, this week yeah, I think uh, I think we put it in the I think it was discussed in our like internal host yeah. slack somewhere was it yeah. I didn't even but, see that yeah I yeah, should pay no, attention to our internal host slack. Slack. <laughs> uh all right well good well, well thanks to everybody first... I think go ahead Victor no we're perfect with my first was my first uh, word processor back in the day so you know yeah I was even before it's that everybody's was, was before that yeah. word no well before that there was like uh was it word star or uh was I was on was what I perfect. was on whatever the proprietary deck uh, word processor was. Digital equipment. WordStar. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I was on WordStar before that. All right. Uh, well, thanks to everybody, and I hope everybody has a great weekend and stays cool. And we'll see you back here next Friday. Along, everybody. Bye. All.